This is Michael from Science Out There. This is the fourth video in a series about Aurora photography and making time lapses. I demonstrated taking Aurora photos with any camera and some tips for acquiring a good image sequence and avoiding some pitfalls. I also did a normal 8 bit per channel workflow for making a time lapse. This time, we're going to make a 10 bit high dynamic range time lapse from a sequence of raw files using Adobe Camera Raw, After Effects, and Media Encoder. Okay, so I'm gonna drag my raw files over to Photoshop again. So now this time the goal is to have a 10 bit output, a high dynamic range output. So from end to end, the entire sequence is done in 10 bit HDR and I'm using the Rec 2020 broadcast standard for everything. So to do that, I've got my same image sequence and I am going to select all and then do a save. And I'm gonna change my color space to Rec 2020 Gamma 2.4. So this time I'm going to actually output the file as TIFF. JPEG does not support 10 bits per channel, but TIFF does. And TIFF is where I want to go. Raw files will support 10, 12, 14, or even much higher than that bits per channel. Uh, and so will TIFF, the Rec 2020 Gamma 2.4 color space. And in this case, 16 bits per channel because TIFF supports eight and 16, but we're headed for 10 bits. The important thing is that every step of the way there is more than 10 bits per channel. So here we are at 16. All right, so I'm gonna change my folder to a TIFF folder and I'm gonna save those files. And again, we wait. So now our image sequence has been saved as a TIFF and now we're gonna load it in After Effects. And we're gonna change a few things about how the project is set up and the composition is set up before we import our TIFF files. Okay, new project. New composition. This time I'm gonna do a 4K one just for fun. So we'll do 3840 by 2160. And now we're gonna go into project settings. So this time we're gonna change our color space to 16 bits per channel. And we're gonna use the Rec 2020 standard here as well. Rec 2020 Gamma 2.4, hit okay. And we're going to import this time our TIFF sequence. So again, we're going to select the first file in the sequence and make sure TIFF sequence is checked and hit import. And we're gonna drop it down here. So the eagle-eyed among you might have noticed that I actually forgot to do this, which just makes sure that when I go to render the project, it's only rendering the part that actually has something to look at. I rendered about 45 seconds of black. So you wanna make sure that you slide that over so that you're only rendering the part that you care about. Once again, I am going to reposition my image the way I like it inside of the frame. This time a 4K frame, so I didn't have that super tiny little thumbnail to work with. Now we're dealing with some big dogs, but you can see you might find that your image files are much larger than what you need for a 4K, 6K, or 1080p video. So now I'm going to show you something a little bit different than I did the first time. I mentioned the first time that noise and grain aren't necessarily very good for video because what'll happen is a lot of bitrate just gets dedicated to reproducing noise and you don't need that. So let's go search for a, an effect called echo. I'm gonna apply this to my image sequence. When I first add that effect, it's gonna switch it to add and you'll notice that the sequence just brightened right up. What it's doing is taking the previous frame and then adding all of the data from that previous frame to the current one. So what you end up with is a stack of two frames, one on top of the other. And in this case, it's an add operator. Um, but I don't want add. I don't want it to just be brighter. I want it to actually reduce noise. So I'm going to just take you right down through the list of what's going on here. The echo time means, you know, how far back do I need to go each increment to add a frame from the previous part of the sequence to the current frame I'm looking at. Now, the next thing is the number of echoes. How many times do I go back? I can add two, three, four, five different frames to my current frame. And if I you know, add a second, it'll just now triple the brightness of the image. I don't want that either, but I'm getting to that. So the next thing is the starting intensity. That means you know the intensity of the current frame I'm on. The decay is how much to reduce the intensity of previous frames. So if I change that to 0.8, you're gonna see it dim a little because now it's stacked the two previous frames, 80% of the frame behind it, and then 80% of the frame behind that. And then finally, we have the echo operator, which is how we want it to stack. Instead, I'm gonna use the one called maximum. And now it's going to maintain the previous brightness. And I'm gonna disable the effect for a second and then re-enable it. And what you're gonna see is that the amount of grain 
has been reduced significantly. Now what the maximum stack does is it just picks the brightest pixel of the previous three frames, whatever intensities you've selected them at, blends them together. So I have the maximum intensity of the last three frames, so all that noise gets blended out. But you'll notice that my stars also brighten just a little bit, and sometimes they even elongate. I made a stationary tripod time lapse and the stars are moving across the sky. Let's say I set this to six echoes, and now you're gonna get star trails. These are gonna be elongated stars because now you're looking at six frames worth of stars all stacked together. So they've elongated a little bit. So now I will do the opposite, which is minimum. And what minimum does is it takes the minimum value of every pixel from the last few frames. And you'll see what happened. The stars actually just about disappear. So you can use this effect uh, if you want to literally delete stars completely from your scene, which you probably don't want to do, but I'm just showing you how powerful this little tool is. We're looking at the last six frames, taking the minimum value from each of them. And in this case, because the stars are moving, it's eliminating the stars. You can eliminate other things though that way, like meteors, uh, airplanes, satellites that are moving through your image, even car headlights that might sneak up in there actually get deleted out because you use the minimum filter. If one frame had some flashlights in the background and the next frame didn't, well the minimum between that is the one that didn't. So you'll see each frame go by without your flashlight or headlight getting in the way and it'll actually delete that content out of there and your time lapse will look good without skipping a beat. In this case, I don't want to completely delete the stars. I just want to reduce some noise. So I'm going to do a stack of three and I'm going to decay them by about 90% uh, for each previous frame. So I still have a few tack sharp stars and I've also got a nice smooth, by comparison, video frame. Uh, there's way less noise than there was before. Now you probably notice there, as I click back and forth, that you will also lose detail in the Aurora as well. You'll see these pillars that showed up pretty nicely on this individual frame. But if I turn the echo effect on, it kind of smears them out and blends them. And if I think that's too much, then I can just play around with the settings. I can change the uh, decay amount by a little bit. Uh, I can reduce the number of frames that I do. Another option is composite in back or composite in front. Um, I'm gonna try composite in back. You'll see in this case, we still reduce noise. We didn't delete any stars. In fact, we're gonna keep all the meteors and everything. And the smearing effect uh, the blurring of the Aurora is just not as much. It's powerful for reducing noise by stacking previous frames, uh, but in this case, it could also ruin some details. Future Michael here. One thing I forgot to mention is that you're gonna wanna load up your Lumetri scopes, switch this to float. I'm gonna scan through the brightest part of this time-lapse and make sure that I'm actually going all the way up to the highest level without really slamming into the ceiling up there. But I do wanna get as close as I can to that because being that this is high dynamic range, you know, use the whole dynamic range. You wanna make sure that your, your brights are as bright as can be and uh, that will make it really pop on a high dynamic range television. If it isn't quite getting up to the top, load up the Lumetri color effect and bump your exposure or maybe the whites up just a little bit until you're just tickling that top, that 100 or 1.0 line. So we're now gonna do a 10-bit video export. We're gonna select my working space. I'm gonna to go to File, Export, Add to Adobe Media Encoder. So now from here you have two options. One is that you could just output this to a 10-bit video file to use later in Adobe Premiere. Another way is that you can just immediately output this to an HDR file. So if you're gonna send this to Adobe Premiere to make an HDR video later, uh, you're gonna use Apple ProRes. And I made an HDR preset for Apple ProRes, and uh, this is just set up with 4K, it's got 422 high quality, use maximum render quality, render at maximum depth, and 16 bits per channel. So that's enough to do a full 10 to 16 bit video output. It does not actually create something that YouTube or anything else is gonna interpret as HDR video though. This is just mini bits per channel rather than saying, hey, play me back in high dynamic range. The reason you might wanna use Apple ProRes instead is that if you want to create a new Premiere project with multiple high dynamic range clips, you'll want to use Apple ProRes video files in that sequence rather than true HDR files. It just, for some reason, Premiere just works with them better, in my experience. 
for actual HDR output, you wanna choose H.264 and then make a custom preset and I'll show you exactly what you need to do. I like to have all of these set to match settings and then I want to render at maximum depth and we need to change this. We're gonna to switch to software encoding and instead of main, we're gonna use high 10. That means use 10 bit. And then for this one, I like to choose the unrestricted or the highest value there. And there's your rec 2020 again. You can now check that box and additionally check high dynamic range. And then finally, you wanna choose include HDR10 metadata. This says basically encode in rec 2020 color space in high dynamic range and then also include information about how to play back the video on a traditional monitor so that when you go to upload this file to YouTube, YouTube knows that it's an HDR file, but it also knows how to interpret that file as a regular eight bits per channel video so that other people who don't have HDR enabled or an HDR enabled device uh, to be able to play it back. And then finally, you need to have an appropriate bitrate. I like to use continuous bitrate. And for an HDR video file, you're looking at about 40 megabits per second. And for a 4K HDR file, you wanna do about 80 megabits per second, maybe even a little higher. And then finally, you can choose whether or not you wanna do uh, maximum render quality. This mostly just makes it take longer to encode, but you do get a slightly better output. So there is your high dynamic range preset. All right, so just to review, match source on everything, render at maximum depth. We need high 10 and unrestricted. Rec 2020, high dynamic range, include metadata, and our target bit rate is going to be 80 megabits per second if we're doing HDR and continuous. So there's that, and now I'm going to choose my file, choose where to store it, and we're gonna do HDR video file. Now you won't be able to enjoy this in HDR because I encoded this in just a regular format. Most of this video wasn't recorded in any fancy way, so I'm just, I'm not worrying about it. This type of file, when you upload it to YouTube, assuming you used a 10 bit or better process from start to finish, you'll get an HDR output and YouTube will recognize that as an HDR video file. And that's how that works. So now we're encoding, and this will take longer than the regular 8-bit one, probably by a factor of four, eight, or even 16 times as long. Uh, this is a 4K video instead of 1080, and we're rendering it in HDR 10, which has several more color bits that it has to chew on. So it's going to take a lot longer to encode.